。各位家长朋友们，大家晚上好，我是爱家网的工作人员海东。今天晚上的主题讲座《通往大学之路》将由我来为大家主持。在介绍今晚的主讲嘉宾之前，请允许我用半分钟的时间来简短介绍一下今晚讲座的主办方爱家网。爱家网是一个位于纽约服务北美华人家庭的新媒体。爱家网提供各类优质生活资源，帮助华人家庭获得所需的资讯。我们将不定期的邀请各个领域的生活达人做微信讲座，分享他们的专业知识和生活经验。希望通过这些讲座帮助到华人家庭。我们也十分欢迎在自己的领域中有所建树，而且愿意帮助他人的朋友们自荐，成为下一期主讲嘉宾。欢迎大家关注爱家网的公众号“北美爱家”，获得下期讲座的信息。今天是爱家网主题讲座的第七期，下面由我来介绍一下今晚的主讲嘉宾 Sally Champagne。Sally 曾经在哈佛大学担任高级招生官长达二十一年，亲自过目并评估的申请书高达近三万份，这样的背景相信很难再找到第二个人。二零零九年 ，Sally 离开哈佛，加入位于台湾的台北美国学校，并在次年创联合创办了 Beacon Star 智青教育咨询公司，为家长。和学生们做升学和留学的教育咨询，帮助学生们申请到适合他们的理想大学。介绍一下今晚的讲座规则，在讲座进行的时候，请大家保持安静，不要发送任何语音、文字或者图片信息干扰他人听讲。在讲座进行到后半段时，赛里将先回答预先提交的一些提问，同时我们将开放大家通过文字进行现场提问，所以请大家把问题留在那个时候再提出。考虑到今天的提问可能会比较踊跃，所以能回答的问题将会很有限，无法作答的问题还请大家谅解。主题讲座的内容仅代表嘉宾本人的观点，不代表主办方爱家网的立场。那么我们下面就把时间交给 Sally 做今天的主题讲座《通往大学之路》。Hi and greetings to all the happy homekeeping listeners out there. Thanks so much for joining me on this WeChat MR, if that's even a word, or webinar. It's great to be with you in New York and its surrounding locations while I look out at my deck in Taipei. Frankly, even though it's only nine o'clock in the morning here, it's too steamy outside already. Let me begin by sharing with you a story about one of my most surprising outcomes when helping to guide students to college. Michael wanted to study to become an architect in college, but had no art portfolio. His GPA was a 3.24. And his SATs were 1430. By any measurable standard, he was not a standout by any means. His mother called me consistently, and after seven months of him writing draft after draft of his personal essay, wondering when it might be completed, since application deadlines were fast approaching, Michael would become easily distracted about anything. So we worked with him on his time management and learning skills. Only then did he start to make progress on his various applications. He pulled together a portfolio of samples of his artwork, which we helped him to critique and select the 20 pieces required. Michael finished the final draft of his personal essay with only a week to spare before his applications were due, and he has submitted applications to 12 colleges, schools like Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Carnegie Mellon, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Northeastern, and the like. Even though Michael prepared 12 different applications, realistically we hope that he might actually be admitted to two, and possibly three, schools given his modest credentials. In the end, however, Michael received nine admission offers, offers, and he's now a junior at Carnegie Mellon University studying architecture. It was a very, very happy ending. Not only was this one of my most gratifying experiences as a college counselor. I think the story exemplifies the fact that while Michael's application didn't check the boxes for what one would think would be an automatic admit, he obviously hit the right notes with his application in order to be admitted to so many schools. When you start looking at schools, it can feel overwhelming. Unfamiliar names of schools can seem to run together, and keeping track of the various tasks involved can also feel like you're a ringmaster of a three-ring circus. This evening, I'd like to share how your student might achieve results like Michael's, even though we know everyone doesn't want to be an architect. 
As a counselor, one of the first tasks is to determine the sort of school which will be a good match for the interests of the student. Where do you start to look for a school that will match your interests and what you hope to study? And how will you know if you have a chance to be admitted? Here are a few examples of most recent admit rates and how they decrease from last year to this one. Boston College was down by five points to 27% admit rate. Boston University was down three points to 22% admit rate. Emory down 3.5 points to an 8.5% admit rate. Harvard down 6.62 points to an admit rate of 4.58%. Tulane was down 3.5 points to an admit rate of 17.5%. UCLA was down 2.1 points to 14%. And Virginia Tech was down 17.4 points to an admit rate of 56%. It's a little jarring, isn't it? Hearing those 2018 admission rates from only a few schools may feel like you are re-experiencing the stock market crash of 2008. I'm quite sure that those numbers don't warm your heart and make you think, great, quite the opposite. They likely send a chill through your veins when you think about your child, your wonderful student who tries his or her best in everything they attempt and they excel. And yet still, they will need to face some sobering and challenging facts about selective college admissions. And you will too, in order for you to be the most supportive and that steady rock which your child will need as they proceed through what can be a confusing and frustrating admissions process. And you don't have to get caught up in the mania and the anxiety of it all. There are actually steps you can take to get ahead of the process, and it starts with being smart about how you apply. Toss out that pre-programmed GPS, in other words, your preconceived ideas, and forget the rumors you've heard about what makes a stellar candidate for a selective college as you and your student get underway on the road to college together. Try to ignore the well-intentioned advice offered by your best friend, your family, your colleagues, your dentist, or even what your church pastor has told you about their insights into selective college admissions and for now, settle in and get comfortable in your chair. You all may be looking to me for all of the answers about college admissions, but regret, regretfully, I'm here today to say that I don't have all of the answers about selective college admissions to give you. But before you leave this WeChat group, please let me explain. I don't have all of the answers about college admissions because there is no formula for selective college admissions. Instead, I'll be sharing my observations and experience in education at both the college and the secondary school levels and offer my thoughts and reflections as someone who has had a bird's eye view and who was part of a highly selected admissions process at Harvard for over 20 years. What did I learn from sitting in committee for all those years? Now as I'm working from the other side of the desk, helping students gain admission to college, there are certain things which I've observed which can help streamline the admissions process and help your student stand out in a competitive admissions pool. I know it can seem overwhelming if you try to go it alone. You can easily make wrong turns and hit some dead ends and waste valuable time starting over. But the good news is you don't have to figure all this out on your own. Help is at hand. For the next several minutes, I want to welcome you to the state of being curious about everything. Learning is an active pursuit that takes many shapes and forms. There is no one set track for students and the opportunities are actually limitless. Being inquisitive and asking questions is at the root of education. Yes, being curious might sometimes lead us into troublesome territory, but it also might set fire to a learning path that will eventually lead to a rewarding career and fulfilling life. Curiosity killed the cat, or did it? The ancient Western proverb originating at the time of Shakespeare, curiosity killed the cat, warns of the dangers of unnecessary investigation or experimentation, and it also holds an essential ingredient to learning within it. I began to think about this proverb in relation to my remarks this evening. Our innate curiosity allows us to dive deep into subjects and ask the hard questions. Why did something work? And conversely, why didn't it? 
Whether or not curiosity killed the cat is something which is debatable, but we know that curiosity is the essential seed that sparks learning in each of us. This evening, I'll be talking a bit about the nuts and bolts of college applications, the essential college application timeline. I'll also provide some tips about how your student can make a difference in their college application so it is one which will shine above others. Universities seek students who possess an open mind. A good friend of mine and former colleague at Stanford, Martin Walsh, often used the expression when describing colleges that they are like intellectual amusement parks. To extend the metaphor further, Martin would then say that each college offers different rides, some more appealing than others. But colleges aren't terribly interested in inviting a student to join their community if the student is merely interested in taking the same ride over and over and over again. Instead, colleges are far more interested in having students in their midst who are excited about taking many rides, and often students who can't decide between Disney Space Mountain or taking the ride through the Pirates of the Caribbean or possibly both. Colleges are really eager to enroll the biologist who will also play in the band and cheer for the football team. They're also eager to enroll the engineer who loves photography and will contribute to the school paper or the historian anxious to participate in study abroad programs. You get the picture. There are many parts of the application which overlap. Deciding whether to apply as an early action candidate versus an early decision one versus a regular action one, taking the SATs, taking the ACTs, taking SAT subject tests, having interviews, developing the school list, seeking letters of recommendation, essay writing, visiting colleges, the list of to-dos can make your head spin. Your student will need to be putting their efforts into multiple tasks simultaneously. Typically, it will take eight to nine months from starting the college application until the time they would press submit. So it's very important to plan ahead. There are certain elements which are part of your college application which, as counselors, we would have no influence over, such as the grades the student received, their testing results, and the activities that your student has chosen to pursue. By the time a college counselor might meet and start working with your student, these data points have already been set and cannot be changed. At the time an application may be due, these different elements, such as grades, testing, and activities, might be considered the hard facts or objective parts of a student's college application. That is, of course, unless you seek advice well before students last year in high school. Some of you may have students enrolled in younger grades in high school. This is an ideal time for students to explore activities they may wish to pursue. These activities, by the way, may lead to discovering an academic interest which they might major in in college. Students might also develop research projects and which will help them stand out in a competitive admissions pool. Perhaps they'll participate in summer programs or summer schools. These are all ways students can add depth to their application. And here's the added bonus. A student will be developing their varying interests and therefore will be a more interesting applicant to college and university admissions committees. It is imperative to excel in the classroom, but it is just as important to gain as much experience as you can outside of the classroom and develop your interests. The other parts of the application, or what I would refer to as the soft facts or the subjective pieces, can make a significant difference in how you might stand out in an application pool in even the most selective colleges and universities. The types of things to consider which will help to set you apart from others also applying, here are, here's a list, determining what schools you might apply to when and how you might apply to those schools in order to maximize your chance for admission, who you, you will select to write recommendations on your behalf. It's important that your teachers who you select um, will know you well, and if you are asking people outside the school to write an extra letter, they don't have to be famous. An extra letter of recommendation should give information that is not in the file elsewhere, and it should provide substance. And also, how do you prepare to take this test outside, like the TOEFL, the SAT, or the ACT, or the SAT subject tests? And when would you take them? And this would also include two parts which are all about the student. 
what you will write about in your essays, and how you will present yourself in your college interviews. In each of these components, essays and interviews, there are strategies to consider along the path for each one. And while each student is different, an experienced college counselor can advise you on how best to proceed at each stage. Good grades and fine testing will help gain attention in a selective admissions pool, but that only puts the student in the neighborhood. This might be, be, ter be determined by comparing the student's GPA and testing results to see where they fall. Do they fall in the middle 50% of the students admitted? Or is the pool of admits and its corresponding statistics seem far beyond your reach? There is much more required for the student to become a neighbor invited into your home for dinner, or in essence, offered admission. And these are the subjective and critical parts of an application, the activities, essays, letters of recommendation, and impressions from the interview. Looking beyond the numbers, selective colleges seek students who possess superior creativity, leadership ability, motivation, athletic ability, etc. Personal qualities and character remain central to each and every admissions decision. As noted previously, many factors besides intellect are considered. Selective schools who have many students from which to choose do not want or have a student body of grinds who are uncreative, plotting, regurgitators of knowledge. To give you an idea of the depth and breadth of the applicant pool at Harvard at the time I left my position there, nine years ago. Harvard had approximately 34,000 students in the pool and only a little over 2,000 students were admitted. And the pool looked a little a bit, a bit like this. More than 14,000 students scored 700 or above on the SAT critical reading test. 17,000 scored 700 or above on the SAT math test. 15,000 scored 700 or higher on the SAT writing test and 3,800 students were ranked first in their high school classes. Remember, at the time, Harvard only admitted about 2,000 students. Now I, can, I believe you can see why we as admissions officers would spend little time examining objective data since the pool tended to be self-selective and nearly all imagined thousands and thousands of students would have similar academic credentials. So, how does a student stand out in such a competitive atmosphere? Grades help determine the competence of the student, and this is then matched to the standardized testing to help put those grades in context. But then you review and compare the student's passion about learning. They may have gone well beyond any boundaries set for them, and this helps them stand out. More about this in a bit, since I may be getting ahead of myself here. The critical part for a student in deciding where they might apply. What schools will match your interests? There are over 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States alone, not counting the rest of the world, so having guidance about where you stand a good chance of being admitted to will mean you will have a successful journey to college. Students can often overestimate their chances for admission and end up being empty-handed in the end. Once the list has been determined, I thought you might be interested to hear what happened after the student hit the submit button and an application was reviewed at the other end. Here's how I would read an admission folder. Even though each applicant was greeted anew as I opened the folder, and I more often than not, I paid no attention to the student's name, their gender, or even where the student was from initially. There were certain things I looked for in order to determine whether or not the student would be a competitive applicant or not. Did the student challenge themselves by taking the most rigorous and challenging set of courses in high school that they were capable of and also excel in them? What sorts of activities did the student pursue during their free time? After a quick glance at these aspects, I would dive into the folder for a full read. I would hunt for a certain spark that might come through the pages. This might stem from the student's essay, where they talked about chasing typhoons at age 10, which led to a desire to study environmental sciences, or from a teacher who said that this student was the best in their 30 years of teaching. The chorus of praise might grow stronger as I read through the file, 
with the impressions of the interview confirming everything already said about the student or possibly not. The student possessing an intellectual spark, someone bursting with excitement to learn who was just itching to ignite in college is the sort of student any college seeks. The common ingredient he sought is curiosity. Here's that cat in curiosity again. Speaking as a former admission officer, nothing is more disheartening than to read an application where it seems clear that the student strives for good grades and test scores merely for the satisfaction they gain in achieving a certain goal and the passion for learning is lost. Likewise, nothing is more exi exciting or exhilarating to a college admissions officer than to read an application from a student who is excited about learning. That sort of energy nearly leaps off the page. Perhaps it might be help helpful if I gave you a couple of examples of students who both stood out in the applicant pool, but for very different reasons. One is the story about a young man from China who energized us as a committee when considering his application. What sorts of things moved the needle to yes and tipped the student into the class and not out? Well, Charles was a student who blazed his own trail because he was passionate about studying Latin. He attended a high school in China, which had never sent a student abroad to the United States. Despite the odds against him, Charles presented a compelling application describing how he had taught himself Latin, he also taught himself English, and he also had started studying ancient Greek. This passion about Latin made us, as a committee, want to study it too. It was that contagious. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, here is another example which illustrates how small points matter. Lucy, a student from New York City, had lots of things going for her until we read her summer school transcript where she received a B in calculus while attending Brown's summer school. As appealing, actually, as Lucy was, the committee couldn't get over her low grade in calculus when they felt she could have easily achieved an A. This element was not required as part of her application, but of course, once a summer school transcript was submitted, it had to be evaluated, and ultimately Lucy was de denied admission. Lucy also tried to be a trailblazer by attending summer school and challenging herself by doing so, but it was not enough to distinguish her in the applicant pool. In fact, it worked to her disadvantage, therefore causing her case to stumble, and all from information which was not required. And going back to my earlier point, what might look good on paper sometimes ends up being a very flat case. If the student's passion about learning is missing from an application, it will often stall in committee. Roughly, only the top 1% of students in a selective admission pool will, in a sense, admit themselves, since they are that brilliant. The vast majority of students will be vying for a spot among a pool of students with very similar and sometimes identical academic profiles. There's no question that to a casual observer, admission results can feel as random as a bird selecting one card from a deck of cards with your fortune on it. Each year, it seems that some schools are becoming even more selective since their applicant pools are increasing in size and the spaces available in their entering class is generally staying the same. Think back to those earlier statistics I quoted about some schools, their admission, admit rates falling this year. It is therefore a wise decision to cast your net widely and apply to several schools which may offer similar programs so you might gain admission to more than one school. The aim in the end is for the student to have the happy dilemma of choice. Now let's examine in more detail the parts of the application all, that are all about the student, the essays and the interviews. It's helpful, though not imperative, for a student to experience a mock interview so they will have practice putting their best foot, foot forward and make a positive impression. While I don't mean to suggest that a student should memorize answers so it feels that as if when the interviewer asks a question, a certain response spits out almost like a robot. A student should know why they're applying to that particular college and also why they want to study the subject that they've indicated. There should, be there should still be spontaneity in the interview 
Uh, and so the interviewer will also sense the student's personality and their intellectual acumen. The student's essays provide the chance for the student to convey key aspects of their personality. That is important, what is important to them and why? There really is no secret to the perfect college essay, and that is one of the main messages that I hope to share with you today. I don't make that st statement lightly, since I think I've read about 28,000 applications and somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 essays in my lifetime. When a student displays their competence in college applications, gone are the days when a five-sentence essay, five essay like the one John F. Kennedy submitted to Harvard with this application will suffice. As part of the Harvard application, which at the time was only three pages long, students were asked to give a careful answer to the question, why do you wish to come to Harvard? Here's what young JFK had to say, quote, the reasons that I have for wishing to go to Harvard are several. I feel that Harvard can give me a better education and a better liberal education than any other university. I have always wanted to go there as I have felt that it is ju not just another college, but is a university with something definite to offer. Then too, I would like to go to the same college as my father. To be a Harvard man is an enviable distinction and one that I sincerely hope I shall attain. April 23, 1935, John F. Kennedy. And by the way, I was not on the admissions committee then. This essay was drawn from digitized sources available at the John F. Kennedy um, Presidential Library and Museum. In this day and age, however, students will need to compose much longer essays than five sentences five sentence ones reflecting upon their interests in the college and the subject they hope to pursue. Essays provide the avenue for you to convey a small piece of yourself. Other people, think about it, other, your teachers and your interviewer will all talk about you in different parts of your application. This is your chance to speak in your voice and to leave the admissions committee with an impression about what you would like to be what you would be like as a member of their community on campus and also as a pupil in their courses. It's crucial that the essays are in the student's voice. Any admissions officer who has been reading applications for an admission season can spot an essay which has been written by someone a good deal older than a 17-year-old applying to college. 17-year-olds use different vocabulary and the tone is different. My advice don't squander the chance to convey to the admissions office something of importance to you by using someone else's words. I'd like to share a story about one of our other students who ended up submitting two very different essays with her applications where the admission results she, she received were dramatically different when she submitted one essay for, versus another. And here's what happened. Amy wrote a very fine essay about a chef she admired for his work ethic and the way the chef took extreme pride in his work. Amy related this to how she felt she would perform as a student in college. I advised Amy as her counselor against using this essay when applying early action to Stanford since it was, in a word, boring. Amy and her family strongly disagreed with me and the ultimate and they ultimately decided to submit this essay with their early application to Stanford. Later on, Amy learned in December that she was deferred early from Stanford and would then be compared against the other students who would be applying in January. Now the debate was on. What to do about the college applications due in January? Which essay should Amy submit? And which one should she choose? Amy and her family had lots of discussions with me about the essay I had advised Amy to submit with the early application to Stanford, the one which they declined to take my advice about. The essay I found to be infinitely better was an essay that Amy wrote about intellectual conversations and philosophical discussions she had after class with one of her favorite teachers. There was a great debate over sticking with the conventional chef essay which, with her subsequent applications due in January, or substituting it with the intellectual teacher essay, which conveyed Amy's keen intellectual depth and one which was written on a completely different level than her chef essay. 
Her intellectual te teaching essay was interesting to read. Moreover, it said more about her as a student than the original chef essay ever could. The decision was made after many heated discussions. Amy agreed to take my advice and use the intellectual teacher essay for her other applications she planned to submit in January. The end result? Amy was admitted to Princeton, Yale, Oxford, and Columbia, among other schools, and she was eventually denied admission to Stanford. The one and only difference in her applications from Amy's early application to her regular application submitted in January was the difference in her choice of essay. She substituted her original, boring, chef essay with a different essay that was intellectually engaging. From this example, I think that we can agree that Amy's essay played a pivotal role in her applications and that the one she chose to submit in January made a significant difference in the end. Amy, by the way, is now studying at Princeton. As a student on the road to college, you will understandably have a slight disadvantage if you sit alone in the driver's seat when you apply since you will only be able to see one curve at a time on the road to college. It would be difficult for you to anticipate the unseen bumps in the road and what sorts of curves lie beyond the one you see ahead of you. A seasoned college counselor, however, knows what to expect along the journey to college from their many years of experience in the field. They know how to help the student prepare for the many curves they will experience and can also aid in cushioning the unexpected bumps along the road to college. In a way, college counselors serve as the ultimate backseat drivers, whispering in the ear of a student driver at the wheel. By following the student's passions and interests, it's highly likely they will end up in just the right place where they were intended to be. I, I believe this. As college counselors, we can help the student mature, nurture those interests so they bloom and grow and stand out about others, others in the applicant pool. There are many, though, think thousands, of students who will have similar academic and testing credentials in the most selective ap application pools, like the Ivy League and other comparable schools equally selective. Determining a student's distinguishing excellence for their application is paramount, so they might highlight that in their application so they will indeed stand above others. College counselors don't try to remold students but rather to help each student undertake whatever course of action in life that is most meaningful to and consistent with their own principles and not prioritize how it might impact their applications. Also, college counselors will help the student identify the points and values that, they are, that are important to them and then help them find a good match for a school which will help to develop those aspects and strengthen them even more during their four years of college. Above all, as a college counselor, I really love working with and guiding, student, guiding students who are full of curiosity about the world around them. Curiosity is the one key universal ingredient, ingredient each school will be seeking in a future student. I take pride in knowing that we help students reach for the stars while also tempering their hopes with a small dose of reality so ultimately their dreams can come true. Remember, students don't get admitted into the most selective schools based solely on their GPA or testing. In fact, selective universities look at the student's entire package. They're looking for that sprinter who will quickly become involved and help to make their community even more dynamic. They're also looking for the next Einstein or Jack Ma, someone with passion and dedication. Remember, your GPA and test results aren't everything. They're merely the starting point when admission officers begin to review applications. An eagerness and openness to learning about new ideas, embracing new cultures different from yours, and a willingness to become involved will always be appealing to selective universities. Students can easily fall within an area of competence and ability, but to truly stand out in the selective admission pools, they need to break the mold forge their own path, and let their creativity flourish so it will shine in their application. And now for my final words of advice. Follow the Boy Scouts motto, and yes, this applies to everyone. Plan ahead and be prepared. Be smart about creating your list of schools to apply to so you are not going to be empty-handed in the end. 
Any school that makes your list should be one you would be happy to attend. If that's not the case, keep looking. Let the colleges know you like them. We all like people who like us. Just don't be a stalker. Demonstrate interest by visiting the campus, joining their Twitter or Instagram accounts, etc. Let them know politely, of course, that you'd love to attend their fine institution. Give yourself time to write essays which reflect you and your viewpoint and share them with your best friend or favorite aunt or uncle to read. If they don't know immediately that the essay is yours, then write another. Take pride in knowing that you put forth your best efforts once you submit your applications and have faith that the colleges you like will in turn like you and invite you for dinner. In other words, admit you. Remember, a student's wings already exist. A college counselor merely helps you fly. Thank you again for inviting me to share my perspectives about college admissions and my views on being on the road to college and reprogramming your GPS. At this time, I'm going to ask Sadie to ask the question of 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 the question sent to me prior to this chat. Number one, my nerdy seventh grade daughter is heavily into science and tech. Will Science Bowl and robotics good enough for her extracurriculum activities? How do colleges look at those summer camps that cost thousands of dollars? Unquote. Colleges ask about extracurriculars to see how the student might contribute to their community. That was often a question asked in the admissions committee when discussing whether or not to admit a student. What sorts of things would the student do here? How will they impact our campus? If the question was bland, or if there was no answer at all to those questions, the case had difficulty surviving in committee, and the attention then might focus on another candidate. When thinking about extracurriculars, in order for a student to stand out in admissions pool, they need to perform at a very high level to move the needle towards an admit. This means often receiving recognition at a statewide or even national level. In terms of summer schools and how they might impact a decision about a student's application, remember the student I talked about, Lucy, who attended Brown Summer School and received a B in calculus? Because summer programs are not required and with the intent that the playing field is level for all candidates, the additional information submitted would need to be evaluated once provided, even though it is not required as part of the application. Students should pursue summer programs or enrichment activities for their own sake and meaning, not for a college application. That said, there are a few summer programs that are highly competitive in nature but those are free for the student attending. These programs, for example, the Research Science Institute or Telluride and the like, will catch the eye of an admissions officer. But again, these programs are highly competitive for a student to be admitted to. A nice summary of those summer programs can be found on MIT's helpful website. It's also fine if a candidate works at McDonald's in the summer, goes to camp, cares for a younger sibling, or helps out a grandparent. These experiences can enrich the student in numerous ways and can also provide some interesting anecdotes for college essays. Question number two. My question is, as a distance runner in high school, will this specialty be helpful for us to apply for Harvard? And how can we prove our abilities? Coach's recommendation? Thank you for answering. You're welcome. Since I don't work for Harvard, I don't think that they would appreciate me answering on their behalf. But to broaden your fine question to include how athletics might impact and influence an application, I'm happy to respond to your question. As with any extracurricular, sports, drama, debate, the orchestra, the newspaper, student government, etc., if performed at a high level and recognition is received, it can help the student stand out in a highly selective applicant pool. Coaches are scouting the country and the world for first-rate athletes to add to their team roster. And when they find a great shortstop for their baseball team or that incredible distance runner, they will let the admission office know of their interest. But don't be shy. Students can and should reach out to coaches if they feel 
that they would want to play on the team to express their interest and to provide information about themselves. This also holds true for debate coaches or conductors of the orchestra or directors of, in drama, et cetera. When they spot a stellar candidate, they'll also let the admissions committee know. The final decision, however, always rests with the admissions committee, but outside verification of a specific talent can help and it might provide the necessary hook for a student to be lifted into the class and, admitting, and admitted. In terms of communicating with admission offices about specific talents, always check to see what is acceptable to send. Is it okay to send a DVD? If it is, make sure you listen to it before sending it. I can't tell you how many blank DVDs I tried to listen to in my day. If it concerns athletics, sometimes a video is sent, but if it's a sport like track, time sent will suffice. And yes, sometimes coaches talk to coaches. It can be very useful if your high school coach might also to contact the college coach. Question number three, elite colleges receive thousands of applicants each year. With limited resources and time, assume that admission officers scan through each application very quickly. What are the key things they look for in those two to three minutes? What will keep them interested in learning more about the applicant? As mentioned before in my remarks, each and every application receives a thorough read. This might include reading the novel the student sent in addition to their application. Of course, if extra material is allowed to be sent. Typically, it takes between 15 to 20 minutes to review the file and then to summarize your thoughts and impressions about the candidate for the next reader to review. If there is an important element that each student needs to possess in order to pass over the bar, it is having taken a rigorous level of courses and doing well in them. That said, no college expects a student to take honors or AP courses or IB courses if they are not offered in the high school. The student is viewed and evaluated in the context of their school setting. But in the end, individuals are admitted and not high schools per se. So the student needs to stand up to comparison worldwide in competitive application pools. Question number four, out of all the college application criteria you look for from a high school graduate, assuming the school has the student has met the SAT and GPA criteria. In the order of importance, how would you rank them? Extracurricular, essays, teachers, recommendations, volunteering, question mark. First, let me say that volunteering is generally considered part of extracurriculars. All of the various components of a student's application, grades received, the rigor of the courses taken, the testing results, which help to put the grades into context, the student's essays, their activities, the letters of recommendation and the interview are given equal weight when considering an application. If I were to highlight one aspect, it would have to be the grades the student has received in a rigorous program. A student's high school performance is indeed the very best predictor for success in college. And that is what, as an admission officer, you are ultimately evaluating. Can this student not only do the work at the college, but also thrive while doing so? As any of the other pieces of the application, the student's activities, the essays, the letters of recommendation, the impressions from the interviewer can significantly influence the eventual admission decision. If the student pursues an activity at a particularly high level, that may be a peak in their application. Likewise, if teachers say that the student is the very best in the 30 years of teaching, those statements carry significant weight as long, of course, as the same teacher from the same high school is not saying the same praise for another student in the applicant pool. Then, of course, it's watered down and essentially useless. Question number five. Assume that two students have the same standardized scores, SAT, TOEFL, similar extracurriculum experiences, and take the same AP exams and get the same score. The only difference between them is that one go to high school in New York and the other go to high school in China. Will the one in New York have advantage in application than the one in China if they, if they apply for the same college? A college could have thousands and 
thousands of students with identical academic credentials as you have described. I referred in my speech to the depth of the applicant pool when I left Harvard nine years ago. And to refresh that thought, Harvard had approximately 34,000 students in the pool and only a little over 2,000 students were admitted. And the pool looked a little bit like this. More than 14,000 students scored 700 or above on the SAT critical reading test. 17,000 scored 700 or above on the SAT math test. 15,000 scored 700 or higher on the SAT writing test. And 3,800 students were ranked first in their high school classes. In other words, if the only criteria sought was to admit only students who were number one in their class, then there would, were, there would have been nearly double the number of applicants holding that distinction than the number eventually admitted. So going back to your question, there will undoubtedly be two applicants possessing the same academic credentials with one from New York and the other from China. The difference will be in all the subjective parts of the application, the essays, the student activities, their letters of recommendation and their interview that will make the difference in terms of admission or not. Question number six, on Common App, there is a se section, additional information. What do you recommend applicants to input on this part? That space can be used to explain extenuating circumstances, a disciplinary infraction which occurred or to give further information about something in the application which may not be clear at first reading. Use that space wisely, however. It is not a space for another essay or a love letter to the college, but it can be helpful to the admissions officer to explain circumstances which appear unclear. And the last question, number seven, from the ones submitted previously, from your point of view, what kinds of essays will impress you and will lead kids to much more chance to top colleges? The student's essay provide the chance for the student to convey key aspects of their personality, what is important to them and why. There really is no secret to the perfect college essay. Essays provide the avenue for the students to convey a small piece of them, him or herself. Ones written from the heart and in the student's own voice are the most effective. Thank you. And back to Jason. How the can you say that? 今天的讲座时间已经严重超过原来的预期，呃，我们就不再做 live 的 Q&A。非常感谢大家参加这次的讲座，特别感谢赛丽在繁忙的工作中仍然抽出时间为爱家网的听众们分享她的宝贵经验。呃，赛丽和她的智新教育咨询团队是帮助家长和学生们提供申请大学的教育咨询服务。希望，如果是你想和赛丽进行私下的咨询的话。那可以通过电子邮件和 Sally 的团队联系，电子邮件的地址是 info at beacon dash star dot com。再次感谢感谢大家今收听今天的这个讲座，欢迎大家关注爱家网的公共号，以便获得下期的微信讲座信息。也欢迎大家加入爱家网的课后活动微信群，适合四岁以上的孩子家长们入群，分享和咨询纽约地区的课后班和夏令营信息。祝大家晚安，我们下次讲座再见。